Hello class, and today we're going to be talking about the economics of healthcare. I always like to start this chapter, even though it's not in the book, trying to explain why do we keep having these conversations about healthcare expenses in the U.S. and you know how come it just doesn't go away? Isn't the system that we have perfectly fine? So <clears throat> here's some reasons why. Before January first, twenty fourteen, we had um, we had a we we were allowing companies, especially private companies, to basically drop you from your insurance if you had some kind of pre-existing condition. Um, now, if you had insurance already, you could basically continue to buy insurance. I mean, in other words, you could pay your monthly payment and keep your insurance. But the problem is, as soon as you develop some kind of pre-existing condition, and the pre-existing condition could be diabetes, for example, then the problem was that nobody else wanted to cover you. So you were basically stuck uh, because your insurance in the U.S. today is mostly provided by your employer then you were basically stuck with your employer. And if you wanted to move to another employer, you needed to make sure that that particular employer that you moved to would have same coverage or better and that it had a sort of group policy so that you would not be denied coverage. <clears throat> As an individual, you basically couldn't buy any coverage anymore. Now, because a lot of people couldn't buy coverage, what ended up happening was whoever had a significant pre-existing condition ended up going to the emergency room instead of going to a regular doctor. Emergency rooms are more expensive than going to your regular doctor. And a lot of the time you don't really need to go to the emergency room because you could do preventive care and your doctor could take care of most things. Also, uh, one of the misconceptions that people have is that the number one reason people file for bankruptcy is stuff like credit card debt and student loans. But the reality of the matter is the number one reason people file for bankruptcy is in uh, health care bills. <clears throat> All right, so what happened to people who had insurance? Well, the people who had insurance, uh, those who had insurance kept paying higher premiums for that insurance. They kept paying higher deductibles and they couldn't switch carriers after they got sick. Then in order to get coverage, you have to jump through all these hoops and limitations. Um, before I move on, though, I also want to talk a little bit about the, the different things that you have to pay when you buy health insurance. All right, so I found this uh, website called eHealth Insurance, and um, I put my information in, and then now I got <clears throat> a few options if I want to buy insurance. So, all right, so to understand, um, again, the sort of lingo, on health insurance, let's go over a particular quote like this one right here. All right, so on this particular plan, notice that the monthly payment is going to be 10709. Okay, um, notice also that my deductible is $10,000 per person. The premium, which is this number that you see here, is what I'm going to have to pay monthly. The deductible is the amount of money that I have to pay out of pocket before the company starts paying anything for me. Let me repeat what I just said. So this is how much I'm gonna to have to pay monthly. And then the deductible is how much I have to pay before they start covering anything for me. Most insurance plans work like that. You have a huge deductible if you have a really low monthly payment. <clears throat> All right, let's pick one with a lower deductible. Monthly cost, All right, so deductible low. Okay, now this um, plan is a plan with a maximum. So this one, notice that you have a $185.09 a month, that's you, that is what you call your premium, okay? Then we have a deductible of only $1,000, which sounds good. You're like, wow, only $1,000 deductible. Remember, the deductible is what you have to pay before they start paying. But then look at what it says here, 
that is your co-insurance. So that basically means that whatever, um, whatever bill you receive, after you pay your deductible $1,000, the company will only cover half. That's why it's a 50-50. So this is your um, co-insurance number, okay? So you have your premium. <clears throat> Let me get a Word document here to, to explain the differences. So again, the premium is the amount of money that you pay out of pocket. So this is your monthly out of pocket. Then you have your copay. Your copay is cash out of pocket that you pay when when you go basically shop. So this is when you say go to your regular doctor, there'll be a copay. Uh, so it's cash out before you see a provider. Usually these numbers are on the smaller side of things. So they're only there to um, to kind of make sure that you share some of the payment. Then you have your co-insurance. Your co-insurance is the percentage of the bill that you have to pay. So percentage of bill you have to pay. So for example, if somebody says you have an 80-20 deal, 80-20 basically means that the insurance company covers 80% of the bill, you cover 20% of the bill. And this is supposed to be a good deal, by the way. This is what quote unquote gold is in a lot of plans. Most people have a 70-30 uh, deal. And then um, on those, some of those plans that I just show you, notice that it was a 50-50 deal. So this is the amount of money that the insurance will pay compared, uh, compared to the total size of the bill. And we haven't gotten into the deductible yet. Deductible is basically the amount you have to pay before the insurance covers anything. So if you have a really high deductible plan, say something like $10,000 in your deductible, then you have to cover $10,000 worth of expenses before the insurance covers anything, which could be again 80-20, in other words, 80% of the rest or 20%. So in a really high deductible plan, what you're basically doing is you have what I like to call catastrophic health insurance. It really only works when, when you are in a in a really bad situation. It doesn't, it doesn't help you most of the time because you're basically, um, you're out of pocket paying um, most of the bill. All right. So let's define healthcare. So healthcare is the goods and services like prescription drugs and consultation with a doctor that are intended to improve a person's health. Um, Overall, the health in the U.S. has gotten better over time. And between the 1850s to about now, average life expectancy has gone up very significantly. And let me show you some of that cool information by going to Gapminder. All right, so I'm pretty sure I may have used this website before in my classes. And um, one of the really cool things about this particular website is that you can create a graph and you can have a relationship between two variables. And you can track countries over time using the time variable on the x-axis. <clears throat> All right, so let's use India and the U.S. as two comparisons. And what you see right here is life expectancy compared to time in all the countries in the world. All right, so here we go. Let's, um, let's take a look at this. So let me click on play, and then what you're going to see is life expectancy in the world over time. Now notice that we're going to start at 39.4, and that was life expectancy in the U.S. in the 1800s. In India, life expectancy was only 25.
All right, so notice again how there weren't basically any major changes in life expectancy in the 1800s. But somewhere around the sort of late 1800s is when life expectancy starts going up very rapidly in the U.S. And notice that a lot of the yellow dots are also doing the same thing. Okay. Now notice right here how in India it doesn't start until right around here, which is early 1900s. So if you look at healthcare today compared to a while ago, it's much better. Um, we are living longer than we did before. Notice also, by the way, that in the last three years, our number has basically gone flat or down. So we peaked at 78.9 in 2012, and the number has been kind of sliding. So we're, we're kind of stuck at 78.9. <clears throat> All right, now if you look at India, India started at around 25 life expectancy, and um, if you go back to about 1925, it was still around 25, 26. It really wasn't up, up until after that that it started rising very quickly. Now, notice that the entire world has basically been the same. If you come over here, then in the early 1900s, the highest life expectancy in the world was somewhere around here with 50. Now, if you fast forward today, about 100 years later, the lowest life expectancy in the world was around 52 which is again really low compared to the rest of the world, but still it is the lowest in the world is the highest it was 100 years ago. So the world has made a lot of good strides when it comes to healthcare. And the biggest outcome, of course, is life expectancy. Now, another one that um, I like to always cover is child mortality as well. So you understand how, um, how this has changed over time. So if you go back to the 1800s in India, the number that you see on this side is the amount of children that used to die by the age of five. So in India, 509 children out of a thousand will die by the age of five. 509 out of a thousand is the same thing as saying 50%. So 50% of the children will die by the age of five in India in the 1800s. In the U.S., the number was 329. So that means that 33% of children will die by the age of five in the 1800s in the U.S. And again, let's click on play. So you see how child mortality has improved significantly. All right, by the way, notice that the numbers on the side here are in logarithm. Let me, um, let me change it real quick to linear. So you see the, the huge drop, okay? So if you go back in time, basically we were stuck at 329 for the U.S. and 500 for India. But somewhere around here, the numbers started dropping very rapidly. And this is, the, again, the early 1900s. And... Um, now, child mortality numbers in the U.S. is basically 6.58 children out of a thousand died by the age of five, which is the same thing as saying your child today has a 99.4% probability of survival by the age of five, compared to back in the 19 in the 1800s when the number was your child had a 66% probability of survival. If you look at India. India number today is 35.2 out of 1,000, which again, compared to other nations, is really high. Um, so that means that 35 children out of 1,000 die by the age of five. So the probability of a child being alive in India by the age of five is something like 96%. Um, 96, yeah, about 96%. If you compare that with the US, again, the number will be 99.4% probability of survival. So that's kind of bad compared to ours, but it's really good compared to what it was even 100 years ago and even 50 years ago, all right? So we have made great strides in terms of um, child mortality and life expectancy.
over time. <clears throat> All right. Now, let's take a look at the healthcare system in the U.S. before we passed Obamacare in the year 2010. And the reason I keep bringing back Obamacare is because the healthcare law, the Affordable Healthcare Act that was passed in 2010 was a huge change in the way health insurance is provided in the U.S. Now, if you look at the numbers before 2009, 49% of people used to get employer-provided health insurance. Individual insurance is 5%. Medicare is 12 Medicaid and Veterans Administration is about 17%. And we have 17% of the U.S. Uh, population uninsured. And that number um, was equated to about almost 50 million people. Now, because of Obamacare, a lot of this individual insurance is now using the healthcare law. And on top of that, about half of the uninsured that you see here is now being insured through Obamacare. Okay? So even though we still have about, say, 9% of the U.S. population or so that is uninsured, a large portion is now insured through the healthcare law. Um, about half the people still get it through their employer. All right, so in the U.S., the way insurance basically works is you pay a premium, which is a monthly payment, and uh, the insurance company says, I will pay for a particular set of expenses. You also have to then worry about your copay, your deductible, and your coinsurance, which I explained at the beginning of the video. Most providers are what we call fee-for-service. That basically means that they get paid when they see you. Um, if you are in an HMO, or something like an HMO, they have different names today, but basically health management organization, what they do is they create these networks of doctors and hospitals, and then you're allowed to go to the places that are in the network when you're gonna go see a provider. If you have an emergency, by the way, it doesn't matter whether you have an HMO or a PPO, you can go to any emergency room. All right, now let's kind of contrast that with other countries. Canada, is what we call a single payer healthcare system. A single payer healthcare system is basically a system where you have the government as being the basically the big health insurance company. So you only have one health insurance company, or at least one major health insurance company for most people in that particular country. And um, in that particular case, in like Canada, the government is the one. Now this would be equivalent to what people are calling today Medicare for all. Now, providers are still fee-for-service, so that basically means that you still have a private provider network. So in other words, the hospitals are still private, the facilities are still private, people still work for a private employer. What changes is the insurance becomes the government. Now, if you are rich, you don't have to worry because there's always services available for you, and if you want to insure yourself beyond whatever the government has, they also have that as well. So you don't lose the private insurance company, you lose it for most people. Now, Japan has a system like what we have in the US right now, which is called universal health insurance. Now in the Japanese system, very similar to what's in the US right now, everyone is required to enroll in some kind of private or public insurance. And according to the law again today, whether you comply with it or not, everyone is still required to be enrolled in some kind of health insurance. That's what the healthcare law says. Now, providers are still free for service. That basically means that you have, you still have a system where private, you got private hospitals, you have private providers, private doctors. Now, one of the problem, uh, Japan has had this system by the way for longer than we have since, since Obamacare. So one of the things that ends up happening in Japan is you end up with very high co-payments and very little preventive coverage. We do have some preventive coverage with um, Obamacare or with the healthcare law in the US. Now the United Kingdom is a bit of an extreme because in the United Kingdom, they have something called the National Health Service. The National Health Service is the same thing as saying the US military or something like that. So it's a, it's a branch of government and that particular branch of government is the one that employs all the doctors and all the nurses. Again, private places are still available. So there's still private doctors and private hospitals and so on, but the majority of doctors and the majority of the hospitals and the majority of the healthcare facilities are owned by the government. And the majority of the people that work there are government employees. This is very similar to what we have in the US for veteran services or veterans affairs. So if you go to a VA hospital, 
the majority of the people that work in those VA hospitals are government employees, and the hospitals are also owned by the government. Now, in the National Health Service, the government directly owns the majority of the hospitals, the government directly employs the majority of the doctors. This is usually referred to as socialized medicine. And this has a bit of a negative connotation because, of course, in other countries like Cuba also have socialized medicine and North Korea, for example. So in the National Health Services, one of the problems that you normally have is what they call priority treatments. Um, priority treatments is basically something that they create every year to try to figure out which treatment works and which treatments are cheaper. So every year, groups of doctors get together and they make decisions on how to treat a particular diagnosis. And then they create a sort of um, number where you go, okay, if you got this diagnosis, you sh you're supposed to use treatment one, then treatment two, then treatment three, and so on. Uh, this is not kind of like what we have in the U.S. in many ways because today your doctor picks your treatment and your doctor doesn't have to go to the most used treatment. He could say change the treatment depending on what you have. Now, we do have some problems in the U.S. where basically your doctor may prefer a particular treatment, but your health insurance does not cover it. Now, in the United Kingdom, most people also have the ability to carry private health insurance, um, and they basically will be on top of the National Health Service insurance. All right, now let's talk about why do we need to keep having this conversation about healthcare expenses. This is a graph that relates the amount of income per person on this side and the amount of healthcare spending per person. Notice that uh, healthcare is a normal good, so the higher the income level, the more of it you buy. And notice how basically most countries follow this sort of trend, this line unlike the U.S., which is up here. Now, the U.S. today spends, or at least, this, sorry, this number was in 2009. I got to find a better graph for today. All right, so I found this really cool graph um, in Gapminder. Basically, this is a relationship between the level of income in countries in the world and the total healthcare spending per person. And notice, again, that it kind of follows this line. All right. So it is expected that the more income you spend, the more money you spend on healthcare. So the higher the income level in the country, the more you're going to spend. Notice though the trajectory for expenditures on healthcare. Okay. Now, if you look at all the countries over here, there are almost none that spend as much money as the U.S. We are at $8,360 per person, while Norway is at $8,000. And um, these are the country over here. This is Switzerland. It's at around $7,810. So we are the most expensive healthcare country in the world. Now, that would be fine if we were covering 100% of the people in the U.S. But this number is the total amount of healthcare in the, in the U.S. divided by the total amount of people. So this number of healthcare expenditures still includes about 9% to 10% of the U.S. population that doesn't have health insurance. And 9 to 10% of the U.S. population, by the way, is around uh, 25 million people. So we spend the most amount of money on healthcare in the world, and we don't cover a large portion of our population. Every country that you see on this top list up here, especially the ones in Europe, they spend, but they cover the majority of the population. Now, I want to also show you, even though they all look like they're close here, let me put this number in linear so that you see the reality of this. This right here is the U.S. Okay? And this is how much we spend today on healthcare compared to all the other countries in the world. All right, now this is how much you spend in the Netherlands. This is how much you spend in France. This is how much you spend in Germany. This is how much you spend in the United Kingdom with nationalized healthcare. This is how much you spend in Italy. This is how much you spend in Greece. All right, let me look for Canada. This is Canada at 5220 per person. 
All right. So the U.S. healthcare system is one of the most expensive healthcare systems in the world. Um, actually, never mind. It is the most expensive healthcare system in the world. I don't have to say one of the most. It is the most. Uh, none of these other countries, as you can see, are higher than we are. And we don't cover a significant portion of our population. And that's really the main reason why we have to keep talking about this is because the numbers don't match. Okay. Now, this is similar to what you see on this particular graph. All right, now let's take a look at other outcomes in the world compared to our outcomes. Notice that if you look at the Organization of Economic and Development, and by the way, this basically, the OECD is composed of the richest countries in the world. So that's when you talk, when you take basically the top 20% of income in uh, countries in the world, that's what the OECD is. So we're comparing the U.S. to the average of the most uh, wealthiest countries in the world. Now, life expectancy is basically about the same when you compare the U.S. to the OECD. Um, compared to the United Kingdom, we're about two years um, sooner. Uh, Japan, we're about five years. We die about five years long, uh, younger. And when you compare it to Canada, we also die about two years younger. Uh, but again, if you look at it, it's about the same. If you look at male life expectancy at the age of 65, notice that again, the numbers are comparable. If you look at female life expectancy, notice that again, we're kind of like on the low side of some of these countries, but the numbers are comparable. If you look at infant mortality, again, we're kind of like on the lower side of some of these, but again, the numbers are pretty comparable when you remember that this is per 1,000. What we do have problems with is obesity in our population. I think these numbers are outdated. It's gonna be higher now and the amount of people with diabetes, okay? But notice that, again, this is not like no one's having these problems. The OECD has also 15% of people with obesity. Our numbers is just twice as high as that. And when you look at the diabetes population, notice that our number is twice as high as that as well, twice as high as the average. So if you look at the outcomes, um, our population is not the healthiest. And we're also not the population that lives the longest, but we are the population that spends the most money. And you see this on this snapshot that I took um, to put it on the PowerPoint. So notice that, again, the expenditures um, in the U.S. are much higher than the expenditures in almost anywhere else in the world on healthcare. All right, now, can we say definitively that we are better or worse off than other people? Um, not quite. Um, it is very difficult to compare a lot of healthcare outcomes because populations are not similar and people don't eat the same, they don't behave the same. For example, it is well documented that eating more fish is better for you. And of course, if you go to Japan, they're proof of that. So they eat a lot more fish than we do in the US and they have a healthier population as well. Um, but it's a little difficult to tell somebody who lives in the middle of Arkansas, we know major rivers next to them, and say, hey, you got to eat more fish because it's healthier for you. Um, so we have a problem comparing data all over the world, plus healthcare outcomes are not the same, and what people call healthcare is not the same. So we cannot definitively say that our country is better or worse off than similar countries to ours. On the other hand, we can definitely say that our expenditures are more. So if you look at our outcomes and using these as outcomes, for example, then our outcomes are comparable to these other countries, but our expenditures are higher. So what I, I like to kind of, you know, to put it into people talk is I like to say that we pay for Cadillac, but we get Corolla. Now Corolla is very reliable. It will take you from A to B and it works, but you're paying for the Cadillac. So in other words, you're paying for a Cadillac, but you're really receiving Corolla. And notice again that these numbers are not even very close. If you compare um, our healthcare system, let me go back. For example, if you compare expenditures in the U.S. to Canada. So again, Canada has a single payer healthcare system, similar to what people are calling in the U.S. Medicare for all. And notice that their expenditures is 5,220 per citizen. They cover 100% of their citizens. We spend almost 40% more than Canada, and we don't cover about 10% of the people that live in the U.S., okay? So that's what I mean by we're paying for Cadillac, 
but we're really getting Corolla because our outcomes are very similar to the OECD countries, but we're paying the most the, we have the world most expensive healthcare system in the world. All right, let's talk about what are some of the reasons for this. Um, the biggest reason is basically an information problem. Asymmetric information is a situation in which one party to an economic transaction has less information than the other party. Now, asymmetric information in itself is not a problem. The problem comes when somebody takes advantage of that asymmetric information and then they charge you more money for it. Adverse selection is a problem of asymmetric information in which one party to the transaction takes advantage of knowing more uh, compared to the other party before the transaction happens. And this is when asymmetric information becomes a problem, is when you have issues like adverse selection. Now let's talk about what adverse selection does. So in a very basic way, adverse selections create higher costs and therefore higher prices. In the US, for example, because everyone is not covered under the same umbrella, then what ends up happening is private health insurance companies have to shop around for what they think are the best customers to include in the private health insurance system. The private health insurance companies are for-profit companies and they want to protect themselves. So what they do is they ask you all these health questions where you're gonna buy insurance with them and they might deny you if they don't think you are insurable or if they think they're gonna, you're gonna cost too much money. Um, they also would create higher costs if they don't know exactly how healthy are you. In other words, they will give you a higher than normal premium just to make sure that they make money with your transaction. So this creates increases in cost in the healthcare system. Um, insurance companies may deny coverage to people they believe may be sick, but they're hiding it. And again, this is a problem of our selection because most people are only gonna buy insurance when they need it. If you were under a national health insurance umbrella, then everybody will pay health insurance whether they're sick or healthy. And then basically it's like prepaying. it. So you're paying when you're healthy, but you're gonna get it when you get sick. And believe me, everyone gets sick at some point. Another example of something like this, and what happens is like in the car market, manufacturers, when they make a car, they offer a new car warranty and the reason for the new car warranty is to give you trust that the car is in good shape um, so you should not assume that when something is new it's going to last very long everybody who's been to the dollar store knows what i'm talking about so basically not everything lasts too long even if it's new some things are just badly made um, so in companies like car manufacturers they like to offer new car warranties to make sure that you are you feel safe you know when you buy their products and be like oh well, they have a warranty so that basically means that the car has to be good um, when you have a used car a lot of companies like to offer you a maintenance contract um, some people call it for example when you go to a mercedes-benz they call it certified or something like that it's really a maintenance contract so if the car breaks, then they'll cover it for a certain amount of time. And it really works like insurance. But at the end of the day, what it does is it offers you that, that um, it, it gives you that peace of mind that even though you don't know 100% the condition of the car, you feel safer purchasing the particular vehicle. Um, a car fact report is another way in which this also um, helps you feel better about the transaction. Now let's talk about what we call moral hazard. Now, Moral hazard is another asymmetric information problem, but it happens after the transaction. So this is when you have already entered in a particular transaction, and then you kind of break the, you break the agreement or implicit or explicit agreement that you had on that particular transaction. For example, imagine that you're a football player and you sign a contract with a particular um, with a particular team and then you decide to start doing things that you're not supposed to be doing that what it does is it puts the entire team in a, in a bind because they have to pay for you but you decided to engage on things that you were not were supposed to and then now you cannot play another way of thinking about moral hazard is when you're giving something like student loan money and you decide to misuse it for things that are nothing to do with school now some of the problems of moral hazard 
is that it leads to highly restrictive contracts, lengthy forms, and continuous monitoring. So if you're a student, for example, you have to constantly be going back and requesting money again, and uh, they check on you pretty much all the time to see if you're still going to school regularly and so on. Now, in, in terms of healthcare, it creates what we call the principal agent problem. The principal is you, and the agent is the people that you put in charge of your health, in this case, your doctor. Now, in the, in the healthcare system, your doctor has more information about healthcare, but you have more information about your health and how you feel. So your doctor may give you, for example, too many exams a lot of the times just to cover his or her back because they want to make sure that you don't sue them for something like medical malpractice that you miss something. So let's say, for example, you're one of these people that goes to the doctor and then you're always telling, oh, I got this, I got that, I feel this, I feel that. And so your doctor tells you, oh, don't worry, you're going to be okay, just go home, you know, maybe sleep is all you need. And then you go, no, 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 but I really, really feel really bad, I need this. So what happens is when you're one of those type of people, then the doctor will give you all these other exams and all these other stuff that he knows for a fact you probably don't need it, but just to give you customer service, they will give you extra exams and extra things that you really don't need. As a consequence of that, it makes our healthcare system more expensive. Um, a lot of the times, doctors may also kind of guide you to more expensive procedures if they have an inherent motive to do that. And um, one that's very common today is, for example, when you're having a baby. So a lot of doctors today like to recommend C-sections and they kind of sell it to you as a sort of, um, and by the way, I'm not pretending to be a doctor. So if your doctor tells you you should get a C-section, then you need to make that decision with your doctor. But what I'm trying to explain is that a lot of the times doctors have an incentive to give you the C-section for multiple reasons. The first one is because a C-section you can schedule and then you can do it whenever it's convenient for both of you, which is true. But that also means that your doctor is going to get paid as if he was performing a surgery because a C-section is considered a surgery while having birth without a C-section is not considered a surgery. And the payment to the doctor may be the difference uh, could be around $10,000. So a C-section to your doctor is an extra $10,000. On top of that, he can schedule it at whatever time you two feel like it, which is usually not going to be on a Sunday night. If you go the natural way to have your baby, it might be cheaper for the system, but then now your doctor needs to figure out when you're going to have it, which could be, in fact, a Saturday night or a Sunday morning. Okay? So... The principal agent problem is created in the system because of moral hazard. Hi. Should you worry about it in the U.S.? Absolutely. Um, if you look at the cost of healthcare in the U.S., it's rising faster than the rest of the world. It's rising faster compared to our GDP, and it is the highest creator of inflation in the U.S. If you look at GDP, 6% of our GDP is what we used to spend on healthcare in 1965, and today the number is 17.5% and growing. If you look at all the expenditures by the federal government, Medicare is the largest expenditure by the federal government today, and it is also one of the fastest growing. Now, what are some of the causes to these problems in general? Well, low productivity and very high costs. An aging population, of course, is the biggest problem. So in 2010, we had about 47 million people. Um, that were on Medicare, and by 2030, that number is expected to go up to 80 million. The next one is advances in technology. Technology is really cool, by the way, and can make your life a heck of a lot easier. And today, we have a lot of surgeries that used to kill people, um, you know, even 50 or 60 years ago, but today they, they don't. A lot of these surgeries have become sort of basic procedures, and that's because of technology. But technology is also very expensive, and that increases cost in the healthcare system. Another problem is the distorted incentives. Uh, doctors today are not trained to save money. They're not trained to control costs. They are trained to make you better, and that's a good thing, but it also means that sometimes they're prescribing things that are too expensive for you. Consumers also don't check um, their insurance bills, and a lot of the times the insurance company may end up, uh, sorry, the insurance provider may end up billing you for things that maybe they never performed 
or for things that are too expensive. All right, now this is the portion um, that covers some of the basics of the healthcare law. And right here, by the way, the, the biggest portion of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, is that there's an individual mandate for people to buy health insurance as of January 1st, 2014, or you're gonna face a penalty. Now the penalty has been removed um, as of the year 2018, 2019. So there is no more penalty. There is no more tax penalty that has been removed. There is an employer mandate on it as well. So if you have more than 200 employees, you're required to automatically put people on your health insurance. If you have 50 or more employees, then you're not automatically required to put people on health insurance, but you are automatically, um, but you have to offer health insurance. If you have less than 50 employees, by the way, the law does not affect you at all. There are a lot of other things that are about the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act did. Um, it required health insurance to participate in what you call high-risk schools. It removed the lifetime maximum on your insurance. A lot of insurance before the year 2010 had a lifetime maximum. So that basically meant that if the insurance company paid more than a certain amount for you over your lifetime, you will get dropped from your insurance. So as I was mentioning before, the biggest problem were people with pre-existing condition. I imagine that you, um, in your 20s, develop diabetes. A lot of the times by the year, that by your 35 or so, you might get dropped from your insurance because it hits that lifetime maximum. Um, the If you get a plan today under, under the healthcare law, you also get free yearly checkups, which are extremely useful because a lot of them are free and you should do it. Another advantage of the healthcare law today is that we extended what we call a child under the healthcare law. So today you can pretend to be a child until the age of 26 and you could be covered under your parents' health insurance. If you would have been around in the year 2010, as soon as you become 18 or 21, you would have to buy your own insurance. So if you're now say 22, um, and even if you don't like President Obama in the year 2010, you should thank him just for the extra few years that you could be under your parents' insurance if you are, if you're, if that is the situation. Um, the healthcare law also expanded Medicaid and Medicare. Um, Medicaid was expanded in the majority of the states. Some of the states did not do a Medicaid expansion. So the states that did not do a Medicaid expansion, that's usually where you have a lot of uninsured people. Um, and of course, the the, the the healthcare law was paid for by different taxes that were put into different items. All right, this concludes our conversation about healthcare and health insurance and our chapter on the economies of healthcare. Have a good one.